Theatre presents. Come in. Welcome. I'm Tammy Grimes. Some mysterious happenings cannot be explained. Some need no explanation. Some are so incredible that even were I to find the reasons, the causes, the whys, the wherefores, it would still escape all understanding. Such a tale the Mystery Theater presents to you today. It is called The Smile. Whenever I see it, I feel as if it's draining my life away. You saw it today, Bill, this thing you call the smile? I see it every day. I see it now. I want to see it, too. Turn around. It's behind you. It's right outside the lighthouse window. Great Lord. You're right. It's there. Did you think I was making it up? Well, I... I didn't know what to think. It does look like a gigantic smile in the sky. And it's killing me. Our mystery drama, The Smile, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis. It stars Tony Roberts. I shall return shortly with Act One. A ring at the doorbell. A woman puts down her violin and opens the door. A telegram is delivered. The woman's slender fingers slit open the yellow envelope. She glances quickly at the name of the person who sent it to her. It's the name of a man she hasn't seen in ten years. A man she has been separated from. Her husband. She closes the door and returns inside reading the telegram aloud. My dear Grace, I'm sure you're surprised to hear from me after all this time. I wonder if you are still teaching the violin. I imagine you have not remarried, nor have I. If we couldn't make it together, I don't think we could with anyone else. The woman puts down the telegram as if she can't bear to read further tucks her violin under her chin and plays. And then... No. She has to read the rest of the telegram, whether she wants to or not. So we separated. Because we could no longer live together or needed one another. But, Grace, now I do need you. I need your help. I'm not working at all. No writing, nothing. I'm staying with Uncle Wilbur at his place on Chesapeake Bay. Remember, Wilbur, can you come and see me as soon as possible? Grace, I believe I am dying, and only you can save me. Yes, I remembered Uncle Wilbur, who could forget that crotchety, opinionated old salt, used to having his own way. The same instant obedience he demanded when he was captain of his own ship. I stood on the deck as we crossed the Chesapeake Bay to Wilbur's place. Now a retired sea captain, he tended a lighthouse which kept him near the water and out of trouble. I could see the two of them standing at the point. At least I could make out two figures as the mail and supply cutter brought me closer and closer to an adventure I never thought I'd live through. Wilbur. Is it still up there? I thought you were looking at the boat, bringing Grace out here to the lighthouse. Wilbur, I'm asking you something much more important. Is it still up there? Do you see it up in the sky? Yes, Bill, I can see it. still there. I thought by now you'd come to terms with the fact that it's always there. That it's not your imagination or mine. Sometimes it comes and then it goes away again. 
I was hoping it would go away today. Hmm? Uh, do you want Grace to see it? I, I, I do, yes. Yes, you're right. That's why I sent for her. I want to talk to her about it. Well, you talk to me about it. Seems to me we talk a lot about it. Why doesn't it let me alone? Why me? I see it too, Bill. Uh, I know you do, Uncle Wilbur. I know, I know. But it isn't doing to you what it does to me. To you, it might be just another strange-shaped cloud in the sky. It doesn't affect you the way it affects me. No, that's true. Well, let's get down to the dock. I think the boat Grace is on is about to pull in. It's killing me, Wilbur. It's draining the life out of me. Whenever it appears, wherever we are, I feel weaker. Yeah, I know, Bill, I know. Uh, we'll just have a long talk about it with Grace. Let's go down now and help him tie up the cutter. Of course, at the time, I didn't say one word. But I can tell you now I was shocked. As I stepped ashore at Lighthouse Point, I was so shaken to see how much Bill had changed. I could hardly speak. He was no longer a young man of 40. His hair had turned snow white. He looked 70. He took my suitcase and the cutter cast off. And an hour later, I was alone with Bill, sitting in the lighthouse kitchen, just the two of us, having sandwiches and coffee. Oh, Grace, you look marvelous. I'd quite forgotten what a beautiful girl I was once married to. Well, actually, Bill, we're still legally married. But I'll take it as a compliment just the same. Hmm. You make these sandwiches? I'm afraid not. Uh, that's Uncle Wilbur's department. <laughs> and what's your department in this lighthouse keeping? <laughs> I'm not doing much of anything, I'm afraid. Uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess you might say I've gone to pieces, as it were. Well, that's hard for me to believe. A man like you always in the middle of things. And you were always off covering a war or a, or a peace conference. Are you doing much writing now? I'm not doing any. My last assignment that I can remember, oh, oh, well, for the syndicate was, uh... <laughs> that's funny, I can't remember. You can't remember? Was it that long ago? No, no, not at all. It's just that I, uh, it just slipped my mind, that's all. Well, let's see, it was, uh, yes, oh, yes, I, I did a feature on Tibet. That's an extraordinary kind of life they live up there in the mountains, the, the Tibetans. No, I read it, I did. That was a wonderful story, Bill. And, and you lived up there with them in the Himalayas? Oh, uh, yes, yes, uh, I did. For how long? Uh, yes, I did. I said, for how long, Bill? How long did you live in Tibet? What? Bill? Are you listening to what I'm saying? You keep looking out the window. Is there something out there? No, no, not there. Not yet, Grace. What do you mean, not yet? I asked you how long you spent gathering that material in Tibet. Time passed as it never passed before. I I can't say how long, Grace. And that was the last piece of writing you've done? Yes, that was it. But that was over a year ago. What have you been doing since? I guess you could say I've been running. Running? Running away? No. No. Running for my life. Bill, are you being serious? Why do you think I asked you up here to the lighthouse? I've never been more serious in my life. Listen to me. We were married for ten years, and some of them were good years. And then we separated. In fact, we've lived apart as many years as we've been married. Now tell me, what is it you're running from? You won't laugh when I tell you. It's the smile. At least, that's what I call it. That's what it looks like. All right. I'll go along with that. This, this is smile that you've been running away from. What does it look like? Well, I can't quite describe it because so much feeling goes with what I see. Uh, when I see it, 
Grace, believe me, it is actually as if I am looking into a giant face that is smiling. Only I can't see the rest of the face. I can't see the eyes or the nose. All I see is the smile. And when did you first see it? I'm not sure exactly when. As I said, I was in a place where time expands and contracts in an unusual way. You said you were in Tibet. Yes. So I can't tell you when, but I know exactly where. I had just left the monastery, the one on the highest peak in the Himalayas, a place that is always in the clouds. The sun, the moon, the day, the night has never appeared there. Only the intensity of the light varies. The people go around like people under glass, like people moving in milk. I think that's why they always wear such bright clothing. You were telling me when you first saw the smile. I had had an interview with the high priest, and I walked out the door of a stone chapel up a little rise, and I looked up. And suddenly the clouds seemed to separate, and I could see blue sky, which I'd not seen in literally months. And up there in that sky was this... this faceless face looking down on me. And from that moment until this, unless I close my eyes to shut it out, day or night, I always see it. You mean you see it now? Yes. Have you anyone about this? You mean other than Uncle Wilbur? He sees it too. Well, certainly. He sees it too, just as I do. I brought it here. I brought it with me. Where I am, there it is. Have you talked to anyone else about it? A, a doctor, a psychiatrist? It's not in my imagination, Grace. I, I'm not saying it was. I'm just wondering if you had discussed it with anyone before. I am not out of my head. It's not a ghost. It's there. But it's what the smile is doing to me that frightens me so terribly. Well, I should think so. You still think it's something I'm haunted with. It's more than that. It's killing me, Grace. That's why I need you. I need someone I can trust. Someone who once loved me. Who will believe what I say when I say it's killing me? I, I try to look away, Grace. It draws me to it. It's draining my life from me. Have you seen it today? I see it every day. I mean, I know it's there. Could you see it right now? Matter of fact, I do. Right outside the window behind you. Bill, I'm going to turn around. I want to see it, too. Go ahead. It's clearly visible. It's up there. I'd say about a thousand feet overhead. Oh, Lord in heaven. You're right. Did you think I was making it up? I, I, well, I didn't know what to think. It look like a smile, but it's strange. It's like a shadow without substance behind it. It doesn't affect you? You're sure? No, no, not at all. Is it always in the same spot? It never is. What do you mean, does it affect me? It doesn't make you feel any differently after you've looked at it for a moment? Any weaker? No, not at all. It doesn't harm Uncle Wilbur either. Only me. Where is Wilbur? Oh, I expect he's outside somewhere. This isn't much of an island. You can walk around it in no time at all. It's only here for the lighthouse, so he won't have gone far. I'm darned if I know what it is, Grace. Bothers the heck out of Bill. Wish it wouldn't. Uh, some natural phenomenon. That's all I can think. Uncle Wilbur Bill says it makes him feel weaker. Yeah, he keeps telling me that. Well, Wilbur doesn't deny the existence of the smile, but he says the idea of it's making me feel weak is something inside my head. Oh, it's, uh, it's there, all right. Along the face of it, I'd say it was some kind of light refraction or cloud density. I, I, I don't know why it disturbs Bill as much as it does. 
But if it's all right with you, Uncle, I'd like to stay on here a few days and see if there's anything that can be done about it. My dear Grace, I don't know whether Bill has told you or not, but it was my idea. I suggested he send you that telegram. I've always thought you were a sensible person, and uh, we all need your help. I'm sure there are those listening who already have made up their minds how this can be happening. Three people have seen the smile. Grace, Uncle Wilbur, and Bill. But but Bill suffers a debilitating weakening when he sees it. I shall be back shortly, closer to the smile itself. When I return with Act Two. Grace Fenchurch, a music teacher, has been separated from her husband Bill for ten years. He is a writer or was, until an assignment took him to Tibet. An assignment from which he apparently never recovered. It affected his mind, aged him, turned his hair white, and ever since he has been haunted by a shape that clouds his days. Something that appears near him that he calls the smile. He has retreated from the world to his Uncle Wilbur's lighthouse on Chesapeake Bay. And it is there that this strange story unfolds. Uncle Wilbur, I have the feeling that you're not very sympathetic to what's troubling Bill. Well, that's not so. I'm just sick and tired of seeing the darn thing around. Bill, did you tell her about our three weeks off? No, I haven't. Grace, I'll tell you. You know, they give us lighthouse keepers 30 days off a year. And someone else is rotated to your spot. So with this smile thing, uh, Bill and I thought, okay, uh, we'll give it a run for its money. See if it really followed him all the way from Tibet. See if it's really dog in his steps. Well, we took one week up in the mountains, a uh, cabin of a friend of mine. We went on hikes, went fishing, and uh, <laughs> sure enough, we hadn't been there for three days. It found us. The smile. Right, spread across the roof of our cabin. Mm. And then we took a week at the shore. It found us there, but where it really hurt, where I realized it was out to kill me. Now, uh, now just wait a minute, Bill. Uncle, let him tell it. Where, where it really got to move was the week we spent in the city. We, we saw some shows visited with some friends of Wilbur's old Navy days. <laughs> Buddies I hadn't seen years. I began to loosen up. Uh, it was great for me. I started getting ideas for stories and articles. Yeah, Bill thought this apparition had finally left him. Well, on the next to last night, we stopped off at a bar on the way back to the hotel. It was a darndest place. The bar had no ceiling. Yeah. And the walls they went straight up into the sky. You, you know that glow that hangs over a city at night? Uh, there was that. And right there over my head, grinning down at me, there it was. The smile. I had a hard time getting him back to the hotel. But I did. People thought he'd had just one too many. So even when the both of you got away from the bay and the lighthouse, it wouldn't let you be? No, it's never left me since. I, I try not looking at it. Sometimes I make believe it's not there, and, and I feel free. But when it leaves those rocks, uh, uh, where I think it lives way offshore, and starts coming this way, I know it's lying in wait for me, and it won't stop smiling until I'm dead. Bill... You said something a moment ago about it comes from the rocks. Uh, I say for the past two months, that's where it seems to come from. And could you find it? At five or six in the morning, just about daybreak, it leaves the rocks that are just at the edge of the horizon. Can you show me from where we're standing? Oh, there. You see those rocks that uh, jut out just where the sun's going down? Yes. From there. No larger than a small black curve on the water. 
seems to lie there on those rocks, and then as the sun comes up, it starts towards me. Yeah. We went fishing one morning real early. Came chasing after our boat like some giant kite chased us. Good. Then we'll chase after it. Hmm? What? Tomorrow morning, while it's still dark, we'll take ourselves across the bay, right out there to where you say this smile of yours starts from. Oh, Uncle, you've got a boat, haven't you? Well, sure I have. A great little sailboat. Yeah, use it all the time. Well, that's fine. Then tomorrow morning. Agreed. Why not? I'm game. See that micro sky? <laughs> that means good sun weather tomorrow. Uh, we'll take ourselves smile hunting. <laughs> The following morning, the moon was still out, the bay was calm. Wilbur told me we had over two hours before sunrise. Bill was walking from the house to the dock, his arms loaded with sails and jugs of coffee and boxes of sandwiches I'd made. It's going to be a great day to be on the water, Grace. I'll tell you that. It's so calm, it's like glass. Will there be enough wind to take us clear across to where we want to go? <laughs> I broke this little red devil myself. She is so well balanced, a bucket of air could carry her for miles. Speaking of uh, balance, uh, let's wait till Bill gets out of earshot. There, there, there. There he goes back into the house. Grace, if I see sort of unfeeling and unconcerned to you yesterday, it is because I'm trying to act as normally as I can whenever Bill is around me. Now, it's perfectly true that I see that darn shape up there in the sky, and uh, I read you half the people who live on the bay have seen it. You're saying then, as I did, that it's a phenomenon. And that's all. It's not out to get Bill. I don't know why he believes it's his own personal devil, out to bewitch him, drain his life away, as, as he says. And frankly... He's doing all this bewitching to himself. Look, okay, he's coming out the door. Uh -uh. Uh, he's got to go around the back door to lock up. Yeah. Anyway, that's why when you said, let's take the boat out and head for those rocks and see the dawn smile before it gets up in the morning, I, I could have shouted for joy. Uh, but I had to act cool, as if, uh, well, why not? Let's see. See, I didn't know what else to do. Bill is a young man. He's only 40. And he looks so old and tired. It just hurts me to see him like this. Mind is a curious thing, right? I think it can influence us any way we want to go from total sanity all the way in the opposite direction. And it's been known to even stop a heart. I'm worried because supposing Bill has the will to die, and this phenomenon, which we both see, you too, is he using that to kill himself without knowing it? We hoisted sail. Bill at the tiller steering, I stayed amidships, and Uncle Wilbur handled the sails. We headed straight for those rocks. The smile hadn't yet put in an appearance, but then neither had this... The lighthouse got further away, and a pinkish glow started to come up over the horizon. Keep a uh, nose, even with the highest rock, Bill. Uh, the one that's getting just a touch of sun on it. Uh, Grace, any particular ideas what you want to see when we get there? Well, is that just a large pile of rocks? Has anyone ever been over there? Are there caves, or, or is it an island? You just really can't tell looking through these binoculars. Yeah. I was checking all my harbor charts last night. And I hate to confess this to you two landlubbers, but I could not locate those rocks. The nearest marker is buoy number nine, which we'll probably see if we sail around it. Uh, Bill, steady with that tiller. Uh, I'll ease off on the sail. Well, then let's do that, then. Let's sail right around it. If it's an island or a, a pile of rocks or whatever it is. Yeah, well, we'll do it the best we can. We'll just take it slow and easy and try to keep from running the ground. Wilbur, Grace, there's something pulling at the tiller. 
and was pulling it out of my hands. Uh, does it feel like we fouled up, Bill, uh, on, on a line or an under, underwater cable? Uh, that's until it go for a moment. I'm hitting as a wreck down there. I couldn't see. Uh, uh, down about. Watch out. Oh. Grace, duck. Oh. We're spinning around. Oh. Grab it, Bill. Grab hold of that tiller. Oh. I'm lowering the sails. Oh. oh, I'm getting that same darn feeling. What feeling? What I get when I see, when I see the smile. Bill, for heaven's sake, will you hold on to tell her? Keep it steady. We're going around in circles. It's the same feeling crawling all over me. But there's nothing there. There's no sign of it, and the sun isn't even up yet. Bill, there is no smile anywhere in sight. Oh, it's got to be there somewhere. I, I feel so weak. Weak. Grace. What? Make these ropes fast for me. Okay. Just wind them around where I've started to. Oh. I've got to take the tiller. Bill! What's the matter? Well, we've hit a rough whirlpool and we're being sucked into it. Bill's falling across the tiller. He's fainting. I don't know how long it took Uncle Grover to get control of our boat, to free it from the vortex that was whirling it around. But as soon as we were clear of that, he and I managed to pull Bill amidships. And Wilbur gave the orders of what I was to do with the sails, and I just did what he said. And gradually, we drifted to a shallows where the water was still. Yeah. Trouble is, we're not moving. Wind's died down. I'll drop the anchor so we won't drift too far. Yeah. How's our boy, Grace? I just keep wetting my handkerchief and putting it on his forehead. How's he breathing? I was taking these very deep breaths as if he's in a strange kind of sleep. His eyes are tight shut. Well, Grace, somehow we've got to get this boat moving and get down along the coast as fast as we can to a hospital. There's no wind. Well, if we can't use the sails, we'll use our arms. Stowed on the floorboards are two pairs of oars. Uh, you help yourself to one and put them in the oil locks. Uh, you know how to row, don't you? Of course I do. Uh, good. I'll take this pair and do the same. We'll start due east. Uh, take your pace from me. We're going to head for that buoy. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. That's due east. About 200 yards across the bow. The black buoy had number nine pins on it. From there, we'll change direction southward. Wilbur, look. Look over there. There's a small red sailboat just like ours with two people rowing, and their sails are down just like ours. Huh. That's a coincidence. But look at the man and the woman. Wilbur, look at them. The man looks exactly like you, and the woman... She could be me. It's a fascinating concept that somewhere in this world there exist duplicates of ourselves. Taking this one step further, which one of the identical two pays for the other's sins or crimes? Or reaps the rewards? Who are those rowing in an identical red sailboat. Is there an identical man lying in a dead faint in the bottom of the other boat as well? And what does this have to do with that peculiar marking in the sky, the smile that has been the nemesis of the man they hope to get to the hospital? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Khan sailboat as quickly as they can, because in the center of that boat lies another man with white hair, a man in danger of losing his life. This man is Bill Fenchurch, who has been pursued since he left Tibet by a form in the sky he calls the smile. Bill is certain, positive, that this smile is draining away his life, whether imaginary or not. The two at the oars do believe his life is in their hands. Watch it, Grace. Careful as you roll. 
Not only because something might hit us below the waterline, but in this half morning light, distances are deceiving. Yes, but what about the red boat being rowed by people who look just like us? Uh, possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Just like the desert, maybe. A mirage. Grace. Grace. coming, too. Oh. His eyes are open. Yeah. How do you feel, Bill? Uh, kind of, uh, shaky. What happened? Hey, you stay right where you are. You're getting a ride. The wind died down, so Grace and I are using a little oar power. Well, what dumb thing did I do? Oh, oh I wouldn't call it dumb. Uh, we just got caught up in a whirlpool back there. And uh, you lost control of the tiller. I'm not sure whether it came around and hit you and knocked you out or if you fainted for some other reason. Anyway, now we're shipshape again and, and we're heading back. So we're running away again? No, oh, no, Bill, we're not running from the smile, if that's what you mean. The sun came up about an hour ago and we didn't see it. The smile never showed up. Hey, say, Grace, mm-hmm. I feel a wind coming up. Uh, ship your oars and head for the tiller. All right. I'll run up some sail, and you keep her steady on buoy number nine. So, you guys didn't see it, and we're not running from it. Oh, that can't last much longer. Why are you lying to me? It's taking me with. Look up into the sky, will you? And, and admit it's there. Admit it. We're lost. The smile was there, spreading the edges of its evil mouth over the top of our red mast like a two-sided pennant. I had never seen it that closely. It seemed to be talking, wordless movements coming out of its opening and closing mouth. The wind shipped us along. I kept my eye on the marker buoy. I knew we had to get Bill to the hospital. That his life was in danger. Hey, you there! Red sailboat! Watch out where you're heading! Robert, it's the same red sailboat we saw before! Can't you see us? <laughs> In all my years on the water, I've never seen anything like it. They act as if they own the bay. Come charge and cross our bow like that. Say, Grace. If you hadn't hung on to that tiller, they would have cut us in half. It's just pure dumb luck. I didn't know what I was doing. I was so mesmerized by the fact that it was the same red sailboat we'd seen before. Uh, they didn't care. They absolutely didn't. Uh, and you know what I think? I don't think they even saw us. But there's three people on board. You did notice them, too. Uh, no, I can't say I did. I... Uh, I'd have recognized any of them. I would have reported them. two men and a woman at the tiller. I could see it all so clearly. Two men, one standing by the mast, raising the sail, just like you were, Wilbur, and the other man sitting down in the center of the boat, just like Bill is doing, and the woman at the helm. She had on the same T-shirt that I'm wearing, identical, blue with red stripes. Are you sure? You saw all that in that instant? And the man sitting down in the chips had the same white hair that Bill has. Well, what do you make of it? Well, I sure don't know. That boat and the people in it were duplicates of ourselves. Everything was the same. I watched them as they rounded the rocks doing in reverse just what we had done. But there was just one difference. The smile wasn't over us anymore. It was floating over them. Now, who were they? Were they us? I don't know how long it took. It seemed hours. But we made it down the coast, pulled into a town dock, And Uncle Wilbur and I, somehow between us, got Bill to the hospital. We waited. They'd taken him immediately to intensive care. And finally, a doctor came out and took us into an office. 
Which one of you is related to William Fenchurch? I am, Doctor. I'm Grace Fenchurch. Is he all right? Are you his wife or his sister? Well, actually, I'm his ex-wife. Uh, uh, not even that. We separated ten years ago. We, we each went our own way, but we're still legally married. Then it's to you, Mrs. Fenchurch, that I must offer my condolences. Oh, no. Oh, no. There was nothing we could do, believe me. The entire emergency staff did everything humanly possible. I'm still trying to piece together what could have caused Mr. Fenchurch's death. But, but, tell me, how did it happen? He was barely alive when you brought him in, and, well, his heart simply gave out. There was no way of reviving him. How old a man was he? Bill is, was just 40. Did you say 40? You mean he was only 40 years old? Yes, 40. Responded like a man who'd undergone shock or some complete trauma. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fenchurch. There's no point in your remaining here now. If you and Mr. Wilbur would care to return tomorrow, we should have much more information. next thing I remembered was it was morning. I couldn't quite absorb what had happened. I got out of bed. It was not my own bed. I went to the cabinet where I keep my music and my violin. It wasn't there. And then suddenly I remembered, of course, I, I, I wasn't home. I had received a telegram from Bill, whom I hadn't talked to in ten years. Please come to Uncle Wilbur's lighthouse, it said. I think I'm dying, Bill had written. And then it all became clear. Grace, you up? Yes, Uncle Wilbur, I'm up. I'm just dressing. I'll be right down. Of course. It was early in the morning, and the three of us were going to take the red sailboat and go out to some offshore rocks to find something. What was it we were after? I got dressed, and I came down to the lighthouse kitchen. It was still dark outside. Wilbur had made coffee. Oh, Grace, I was just about to go up to your room and knock on your door. Don't you remember? We wanted to get an early start to sail out to the rocks. <laughs> Bill overslept, too. Had to wake him up. He's getting dressed now. Wilbur... You are going to think that I've taken him out of my senses, but I... Uh, I simply cannot remember why we planned this excursion. You're joking. It was, uh, your idea. It was? The smile. Uh, now do you remember? The, the smile that's been haunting Bill ever since he came back from Tibet. Oh, of course. Oh, oh please forgive me. I, I, I knew it was something. Hmm. Now... Uncle Wilbur, do you believe in second sight, a precognition? A precognition? Having seen something in advance to its happening? Yeah. What? I, I, I don't want to go out on the boat this morning. And I don't want you to. Or Bill. I think that we should all stay here. <laughs> well, talk about a woman changing her mind... Uh, would you mind telling me why, Grace? Yes. I either know of something that will happen to the three of us, or I've dreamed something that I don't want to happen. As we sat there, I recalled every incident as it would be happening, from our conversation on the dock as we loaded the boat, to Bill manning the tiller, to arriving at the rocks, getting caught in the whirlpool. Then Bill fainting, the wind dying on us and our starting to row and being almost cut in two by an exact duplicate of our red sailboat in which we were traveling. Three people exactly like ourselves. And then finally ending up at the hospital. Too late to save Bill's life. Well, I don't know what to say about all this. It certainly was an extremely vivid nightmare. So you, for one, don't believe it'll happen? Of course not. 
Uh, we are going to track down the smile as agreed to yesterday. You had a vivid dream, Grace. And that's all it was. Well, it's hard for me to believe it was only a dream. I wish I could have convinced you. Good morning, Grace. Good morning, everybody. It's going to be a beautiful day. Oh, thank the Lord you're alive, Bill. You know, I said exactly the same thing to myself when I got up this morning. By the way, I've been standing on the stairs for a few minutes, and I want you to know I heard everything you were telling Wilbur. <gasps> I'm glad you do, Bill. I thought it very entertaining. Didn't you? <laughs> the way Grace told it, one could almost believe it. You can believe it, Wilbur, because I had the same dream. If it was a dream. What? I want to show you both something. Now, Wilbur, to your knowledge, I haven't been out in the skiff since we painted it, have I? You mean since we painted red? No. No, we haven't. I'm not sure it's completely dry this morning, but we'll see. Uh, when you called me and woke me up this morning, there was red paint on my sheets. I, I looked at my hands. I'm turning them over now so you can both see my palms. Look, mm. that's red paint. Mm. Well, I must have been holding the tiller. Oh. I don't understand this at all. Wilbur, I'll have that cup of coffee, too. All right. That red paint in your hands could have only gotten there if... Huh. Well, why don't I remember if I was there with the two of you, just as Grace says it happened? Uh, here's your coffee. Thanks, Uncle. Why don't you remember, huh? I don't know if you don't. Uncle Wilbur, would you take another look at Bill? What for? Look at him closely. Well, I'm sure he looks pretty good. In fact, why don't I remember seeing him? Oh. I feel very good. Strong. Wearing to go. Bill, you look a thousand years younger than when I got here. Say, what are you doing here anyway, Grace? I, not that I'm not all for it. It's a nice surprise. You don't remember inviting me here to Uncle's Lighthouse? Yes, I do, sort of. Um, or do I? <laughs> Bill... This dream, or whatever it is that we lived through, you and I, very close to the end of it, an identical little red sailboat crossed ours and took with it what you used to say had been haunting you. Oh, yes, yes, the uh, smile in the sky. I wonder why that upset me so much then. And in that other duplicate red boat were three people. Duplicates of me and of Wilbur and of you, the old you, the old Bill who was sick and who needed me, was in that other red sailboat which disappeared and which we never saw again. And why it existed, I, I don't understand. But what I do know is that you are here and very much alive and your eyes are sparkling and you look very distinguished. A young man with white hair. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, I'd say you are the Bill Fenchurch I remember when you and I were first married. Well, uh, uh, yeah, he does. Looks like a man with a new lease on life. Well, I feel that way. I sort of feel like uh, life is something to smile about. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that what we have just heard is not an identical dream as dreamt by two people. I'd say that it did happen. And somehow everyone concerned was given a second chance. And as for that mysterious, fateful entity that appeared as the smile, that sort of worries me. Before ringing down the mystery third curtain, I'd like to say just this. There is somewhere in the world that is such a cloud casting its shadow as the smile. 
But it's smiling at someone else. Not you or me. I shall return shortly. When I was a kid, Thanksgiving dinner was fun. All our relatives would come with part of the dinner. Mom cooked the turkey. Someone else would bring a vegetable, salad, or dessert. And Aunt Helen, well, she was my favorite relative. She always brought the Whitman sampler. Everything in that sampler was delicious. And you know, my favorite chocolates back then...